Hey, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Kit Opie. Um, I'm a research fellow here in evolutionary anthropology. Um, and I'd like to start, if I can, by asking you what you think about this question. So, if everybody could put their hand up who thinks that humans are naturally monogamous, um, we can see, does anybody think humans are naturally monogamous? No, okay. Um, who thinks that they are not? Anybody think that humans are not naturally monogamous? Okay, right, okay. Um, well, I did a, an online survey recently, um, and I found a similar kind of result to, um, to your feelings about the matter. Um, most people uh, either didn't know or uh, thought that humans were not. Um, I also asked them another question, which was, were they in a monogamous ma uh, relationship? And the vast majority of people said, yes, they were. So this uh, sort of surprised me slightly, but it seems as though people who are in a monogamous relationship, perhaps they're having a few difficulties and they're feeling that it doesn't feel very natural to them. Who knows? Uh, I didn't ask them any other questions. So there may be little that any of us have in common with the royal couple, except that most of us will raise our children in a monogamous pair. But just as with royalty, this arrangement doesn't always last. So what we can say is that monogamy, um, though not necessarily for life, is the general pattern for raising and rearing kids, um, both here and across the Western world. But in fact, worldwide, the majority of societies um, both allow and encourage polygyny. And in these societies, wealthy men can afford to have many wives. Men of average means have one wife, and poor, usually young men, have to wait a very long time to have any chance of getting married at all. So why is it then that those places, uh, Europe, where European languages are spoken, and other places around the world that speak European languages, are so different from the rest of the world? In order to look at this, we need to travel back in time um, and look at the roots of the Indo-European language family. That's the language family that English is part of and most of the other languages that are spoken in Europe. And we can use the family tree of those languages to travel back to the origins of the Indo-Europeans. And researchers have um, identified that these early speakers of Indo-European languages uh, lived in Anatolia, uh, which is modern-day Turkey. Um, they were early farmers. Uh, they lived uh, in Anatolia about 9,000 years ago. And a master student and I, last summer, used this same family tree of languages to reconstruct the marriage system of these early farmers and discovered that they were indeed polygynous. So these early Indo-Europeans left uh, Anatolia and spread out both um, west into Europe and east as far as India and they took with them their early farming techniques, their languages, um, and their marriage practices. And marriage stayed pretty similar um, until much, much later when uh, the ancient Greeks and then the Romans um, changed things. The wealthy men um, in those societies um, were very concerned that they didn't want their wealth split amongst too many children. So when... Um, when their wealth was inherited, um, what they wanted was that they were just inherited by uh, the offspring of a single wife. And so they became monogamous. But it's not necessarily monogamy as we know it. 
because they continue to have a number of concubines. And these concubines had uh, status, uh, they had rights, in fact, they had most of the rights of a wife, except that their children wouldn't inherit uh, when their father died. So we can suggest then that um, uh, since at least the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago, wealthy men worldwide um, have, uh, their preference is for a polygynous marriage unless inheritance um, gets in the way. But of course, as a species, we have, uh, we have lived uh, for 200,000 years now, um, and um, for the vast majority of that time, we live as hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers have no wealth, they keep no land or, uh, or animals, um, and therefore inheritance is not uh, an issue for hunter-gatherers. And if contemporary hunter-gatherers, of which there are only a few left, are any model for how we lived uh, for all that time, then it looks like uh, we were originally monogamous. But where does monogamy come from in the first place? Well, in order to investigate this, we need to look broader across the animal kingdom. And uh, what we find is that amongst birds, um, monogamy is very common. And this is because very soon after conception, uh, female birds lay their eggs, and this allows um, the male and the female to cooperate in incubating, uh, then helping those eggs to hatch, and uh, feeding and rearing the subsequent chicks. By contrast, mammals um, are very rarely monogamous. And this is because they have a very different reproductive system. Uh, mammals have internal gestation, that is, pregnancy. Um, and uh, also, females lactate. That's uh, what we think of as breastfeeding. And so, for the whole of that period, there's very little that males can do to help their offspring. It therefore pays a male to, once he is mated with a female, to leave her and look for additional mating opportunities elsewhere. It's therefore something of a puzzle to uh, work out why one group of mammals, the primates, are much more likely to be monogamous than other, than other mammals. And if we want to discover why, we again have to go back into uh, the evolutionary history of primates, including us. And we can use the family tree again of all primate species, and we can travel back in time to 75 million years ago when um, the original um, ancestor of all living primates lived. Now this is 10 million years before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. And the primates didn't look like primates now, but looked much more like a, a kind of squirrel. And uh, we have reconstructed um, the mating system of this ancestral primate. The methods we use are very similar to those used by uh, Nate Silver. You may have heard of him. He uh, accurately predicted the last two US presidential elections. Uh, the methods are also used by Google. Um, it's the, the method that they use to produce the, um, the results when you put a search term into their search engine. But instead of uh, predicting the future, we're using these methods to reconstruct the past. And so we've used these methods to reconstruct the mating system of this ancestral uh, primate, and it turns out that it was promiscuous. It had a multi-male, multi-female uh, mating system, very much like these proboscis monkeys uh, who live today. Um, so all the males mate with all the females in, in the troop. 
And this is the general pattern amongst uh, all mammals, and it persisted as the pattern amongst uh, ancestral primates until very much later in our evolution. In fact, only about 25 million years ago did monogamy first appear uh, in primates. Now, there are a number of explanations for why this appearance should take place. The one that everybody likes is that uh, primates are pretty similar to birds, that primate males um, get involved in caring for their offspring. Um, these uh, marmoset males do all the carrying, all the fetching, all the grooming, all the looking after of the infants apart from lactating. <coughs> Uh, and so the females are uh, enabled uh, to concentrate solely on that. Um, but we used uh, the Nate Silver technique to, uh, to uh, investigate this uh, hypothesis, and we found that instead of uh, paternal care, as it's called, male care preceding monogamy, actually monogamy evolved first. And it was only once... Um, the, uh, the two individuals were in a monogamous pair that the males started um, doing this uh, care for their infants. So another explanation for the evolution of monogamy is to do with um, the, uh, the actions of, of females. Some, um, some females, uh, like this uh, gibbon in Southeast Asia, uh, who don't experience um, much predation, spread out in, in the environment. And it was suggested that males would like to monopolize more than one female at a time, but they can't because of uh, this action by females. And so they stick with a single female uh, and, uh, and form a monogamous pair with her. Again, we looked, at, um, we looked at this using the Nate Silver techniques, and we found that um, instead of this spreading out happening before evolution, the evolution of monogamy, it happened afterwards. So monogamy evolved first, and then uh, the females were seen to spread out. So it could not have been the cause of monogamy. So this leaves us with the last explanation. Uh, it's the one that no one likes, um, and that's because it's downright nasty. And that is that monogamy evolved for protection, protection of infants against infanticidal males. Now, the general pattern for uh, all of mammals is that uh, lactation or breastfeeding is shorter than gestation or pregnancy. So uh, a female mammal um, will um, uh, give birth to uh, her offspring, and immediately uh, be able to mate. And this means that she will have weaned her first infant before the birth of her second infant. Um, and, um, and this was the general pattern also for the ancestral uh, primates. But as during primate evolution, primate brains started to increase in size. And as as that happened, um, in order to grow the large brains of infants, females had to extend the lactation period to grow those large brains. And as that lactation period uh, grew, it got to the point where it was longer than the gestation period. The females could no longer mate immediately after um, giving birth. They had to delay their return to fertility. Um, and it was this delay that enabled males who were not the father of the infant to come in, kill the infant, and therefore get the female to return to fertility sooner and then have a chance to mate with her. So, amongst larger brained primates uh, now, the females who have unweaned infants are on full alert whenever a strange male is in the vicinity. But unfortunately, it often ends in tragedy. 
Occasionally, it might be that one of the infants gets away. But a much better strategy is for an infant to have two parents, male and female, looking after it, um, providing it with care and so on, and crucially, keeping it safe from uh, infanticidal males. So this means that we can uh, suggest a scenario for the evolution of monogamy in primates and why primates might be so different from other mammals. So initially we have um, uh, the ancestral primate is promiscuous, uh, small-brained, and with short lactation periods. As the brains start to grow, lactation periods need to grow uh, in order to grow those large brains, and when lactation becomes longer than gestation, infanticide starts to become an issue. Among some of the primates that experience this infanticide, monogamy is the strategy that they adopt. And once that happens, it's then possible for the males to provide care for their infants and for the pair to spread out in the environment, which has the additional advantage of being further away from any other male that might cause problems. Now, amongst the great apes, including humans, we have extremely large brains compared to other primates. And that means that lactation periods amongst um, the great apes are extremely long. Orangutans don't wean their offspring until they're seven years old. And amongst gorillas, the highest cause of death for infants is infanticide. So when a, a new silverback enters, um, enters a group, he kills all the unweaned infants without fail. And then the females come back into fertility and he's able to mate with each of them. So this suggests then that during human evolution, after the split with our closest um, uh, relatives, the chimpanzees and the bonobos, about six million years ago. At some point, monogamy evolved in humans. And once that happened, males could get involved in uh, infant care. And the, one of the results of this was an even larger brain size amongst uh, humans. So that it is now four times the size of chimpanzees or bonobos. Now, this brain, of course, allows us to do many things. It allows us to choose how to live, for example. It allows us to choose how we raise our children. But my suspicion is that we're still affected by our evolutionary past, by the monogamy that we adopted during human evolution. And despite uh, the difficulties that uh, some people clearly experience in that, um, a lot of us are encouraged in this direction. So, thank you very much for listening.